All right, uh, I'm Josh Peake. I will be uh, moderating, or what am I supposed to be doing? Something in this session, that's right. Iron Fist, they call me Iron Fist Josh. I'd like to point out that the last speaker is Alex Lazarian. So if you run over during your talk, you must join me at the end to drag Alex Lazarian off the stage. All right, so that is gonna be your responsibility, speakers. So you know, you know who you are. All right, so first up we have uh, L, L, L Matt Hafner. Um, uh, I did not know that. Uh, on the Wisconsin H Alpha Mapper uh, Sky Survey and whatever comes after the colon. Matt, take it away. I uh, thank the organizers uh, for inviting, um, for letting me talk here. I want to advertise, uh, basically this talk to me, advertise of the, the WAM uh, Sky Survey, which we hope to release in a couple weeks. Um, this uh, effort has taken a lot of people over many years, a couple decades now, and um, just want to point out few really important people. Ron Reynolds, of course, is the instigator of all this, and he deserves most of the credit. Um, a few of my grad students, Brianna Smart and DK, who you've seen around here with the green uh, headband on, um, are the current uh, workers on the project. And um, Brian Babbler, who you've heard and seen all day today with the microphone, um, really deserves a lot of credit, just like for the Galpha H1. Uh, reducing uh, data and really keeping us on track to get this out. <clears throat> I realize no one has really talked much about the WIM, the Warm Ionized Medium. I'll give it just a real brief overview. I encourage you to look at this review article, which actually is a compilation of a number of authors um, and actually is uh, was a byproduct of one of the other Carl Hylas meetings in 2004 in Arecibo. Um, this is basically a compilation of the um, results from the session that we talked about, the warm ionized medium. Um, so um, the WIM is a major component of the ISM. Um, it's, uh, it has a uh, sort of scale height of about a kiloparsec or, um, around the galactic plane and um, fills the volume about 20 to 40 percent. Um, and it requires, you add up all the H alpha that we see, the recombinations, the ionizations require quite a large um, uh, energy budget. So that power requirement is high. Um, it requires about, it, just a ballpark, about 15% of the OB Lyman con continuum flux, or if you want to use all the mechanical energy of the supernovae, um, we know that's not happening with all the shells that we've been seeing, but that just gives you a ballpark of the energy that you need to sustain this layer. Um, it's spectrally different from the classical H2 regions. Um, it predominantly has lower ionization uh, states for nitrogen, sulfur, and oxygen. Uh, that gives us a nice handle on a way to actually separate uh, the different kinds of H2 that we see out there. Um, there's two general possibilities for why those ions are in lower state. Um, the ionizing spectrum could be softer, but we're leaning more, much more now toward the fact that the um, photon to gas ratios, the ionization parameter, is lower. Um, this component is seen, whoops. Um, in other galaxies as well. Um, and from there, you can get a, a gl different global perspective. Um, it varies depending on star formation rate, but about 25 to 60% of the luminosity, the H alpha luminosity, is actually emitted from the warm ionized medium and not from these class, the classical H2 regions, the bright regions. Um, edge on galaxies show that there's a, there, it, it is distributed sort of in this widespread thick disk. In the ions, uh, the spectrum that I mentioned is also very similar. They're in a lower ionization state. So at this point right now, only O stars really we think can produce enough radiation to comfortably ionize the WIM. Um, we've sort of changed our mode from thinking about what is the source to what's the tr what's, how do we transport those photons. And uh, there's been a lot of uh, great work done um, in modeling and theory of the ISM showing that um, we moved well away from a smooth uh, distribution and the turbulent medium that we have that's more realistic today uh, allows channels for ionizing photons to actually propagate into the interstellar medium much more easily. 
So in the mid-90s, uh, Ron Reynolds um, proposed and got funding to build the Wisconsin H-alpha mapper. Um, it is designed predominantly to study this phase of the interstellar medium. It's basically analogous to a single dish radio telescope, but in the optical. We get a single spectrum of about 200 kilometers per second. Um, it's fully tunable in the optical, so we can do H alpha and many other lines. And then um, we can put those uh, spectra together into a map, just like you do in the radio. Uh, we were at Kitt Peak in, uh, doing a northern survey for about 11 years, and then took a, about a year to move down to CTIO, where we've been observing since. Um, so the Sky Survey, the northern portion was released um, about 10 years ago or so, and um, we're releasing the full survey, at least the initial release, sort of a DR0 in the next couple weeks. Um, it's very sensitive. This is about an, sort of like a million times fainter than the uh, Orion uh, emission measures. Um, It'll be available on the web at our, at our website, and there'll be a paper following this summer, hopefully. This is just some examples of what the spectra looked like, but let's go right to the actual data. So here's the full, the, I, um, uh, there will only be two Atoff hammer projections in this talk. This one rotates, so I, that's helpful. <laughs> uh, so this is H-alpha emission integrated from basically minus 100 to 100 kilometers per second around the LSR. And what I would just want you to take away initially is that it, this is a widespread diffuse component. It has lots of filamentary structure. We, there, it's superimposed. Uh, you have uh, diffuse H2 regions, um, large um, super bubbles and super shells, a couple of which I'll highlight in a minute. And of course, having spectra allows us to isolate in velocity space. And we, you can see uh, different quadrants of the galaxy highlighting. We see galactic rotation. The H-alpha emission, even the extended H-alpha emission above the galactic plane really seems to know about the spiral structure of the galaxy very well. Um, again, kind of pointing to the idea that the OB stars are powering it. Let's look at the uh, longitude velocity diagrams. Here, this is just five degrees above the plane, and, but you can see the imprint of galactic rotation here. Um, this is logarithmic scale, so you're not going to see a lot of peaks. What I really want to show you is the full range. So everything in gray here is basically detected part of the spectrum. This is above and below the plane. And then if we go about 20 degrees above and below, we're still seeing that imprint of galactic rotation showing that this layer um, extends to quite a few hundred parsecs. Um, let me just highlight some of the spiral arm structure that we do see. Perseus arm came out of our northern survey. Uh, we've done a couple of papers on that if you want to get a um, background there. Um, it has this uh, really amazing sort of kiloparsec high uh, double lobed um, shell structure. Right now, that's powered probably by W4, 3, 4, 5, those uh, star forming regions there. But the structure is old enough that it, it, it was definitely a previous generation that provided the mechanical energy for that. Sagittarius arm, also from the northern survey, is a little bit trickier. You have the Kilo rift here, so the north is kind of uh, blitzed out for us in the optical. But the southern portion still provides you some handle on the um, vertical extension in that direction. The real powerhouse and one of the really expectations going to the southern hemisphere was uh, this part of the galaxy here, just on the other side of zero, the Scutimus and Taurus arm. Um, it had, the dust is very much more confined to the galactic plane, and we we're able to really probe this structure immediately off the galactic plane all the way up to at least 30 degrees. Um, Alex Hill had a paper on some really initial results of this a few years ago. And uh, a little bit closer is the uh, Carina arm, at least the, the near part here. And uh, DK has a poster out there that you may have seen. And if you haven't, please stop by over the next two days and talk to him about the details. 
this is probably the one chance we have to see, at least in, in the um, H alpha, to really see an arm um, actually come around the tangent point and perhaps uh, be able to trace it all the way to a much higher galactocentric radius. Um, in addition to those uh, spiral structures, of course, we have really nice uh, large scale nearby super bubble structures, bubble structures. I, um, this uh, is the gum region. There's uh, the Antlia supernova up here in the corner. You have um, um, Vela and Puppis, and there's lots of X ray emission. This is going to be a, a fun region to detangle. Uh, with WAM, though, we have the kinematics, which is really going to help, help on one hand. And we're, we're also going to do full multi-wavelength surveys in sulfur-2, nitrogen, oxygen-3. And that'll hopefully be able to disentangle these different um, regions, the different overlapping bubbles and super bubbles in this area. The last one I want to stop on is an old friend. Um, Orion Aridinus super bubble. And overlaid on top of here is the H1, um, some H1 contours that sort of roughly define sort of the outside of this bubble. Um, Carl uh, collaborated with us on a couple papers, uh, one of which really showed the, the multi wavelength structure of it with the X ray emission on the inside, the uh, H alpha, and then the, uh, the uh, H1 on the outside. And um, since then, I've kind of thought that we had this picture mostly done. Um, I was preparing for another talk and doing um, moment maps, which I haven't done much of, because I, at that point, I was doing stuff in the Magellanic system. And I decided to do a first moment map here, which I had never done before, um, in the H alpha, at least. And just focus down here. And what's really interesting is here is a first moment map of the H alpha, and again, the, uh, in the blue is H1, the same contours. And there's a structure that's, very f that's much fainter than inside the uh, Orion Aridin super bubble that definitely knows about the super bubble and has an interesting velocity um, associated with it. So I'll just do a little blink back and forth, and you can kind of see how the, the much brighter H alpha emission lies on the real inside of this H1 filament. And then there's that feature that shows up from the moment map, which is our interesting velocity feature. So we'll have to go back and do a little bit more on there, which is great. Outside of the main part of our survey, which only covers about plus or minus 100 kilometers per second, just due to the limitations of the instrument, we can tune it to other velocities. But um, this gas is much, much fainter. Uh, but we can do lots of uh, HVC complexes, which we did. We did this in the, when we had it in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, we have quite a series of papers on IVCs and HVCs there. Um, but now, really in the South, what's been distracting us is that we're now probing the Magellanic system. And Kat Barger had the first poke at this in the um, Magellanic Bridge. The image here is, is H alpha from WAM, and the contours are from H1. We pretty much detect H alpha everywhere. We detect H1 and even some H alpha in places that you don't see H1 at the limits of the H1 surveys right now. Widening this out a bit, this is really rough. Uh, DK did this for us, put together a few different data sets that we're working on. Uh, this was around the LMC, around the SMC, and then the bridge data that you just saw. And you can see we have extended H alpha emission that really goes out, again, to the limits of the H1 contours. I got it. And then we are um, start uh, in the middle of uh, Brianna Smart, one of my grad students, is doing a full survey of the Magellanic Stream. I, I don't have time to show much of that here, but know that that's coming uh, sometime in the next year or two. So just to summarize, um, look for the WAM Sky Survey it's very soon. Um, this initial data release is really taking the northern survey and just kind of putting the, the southern calibrated data in the slot where there was no data. Um, I'd like to do one more revision of that where we blend the north and the south a little bit more nicely because we have some, a lot of overlap regions there. Um, that's probably another year down the road, but I hope we'll get there. We're also doing uh, full sky surveys in sulfur-2 and nitrogen-2, a very thick plane survey in H-beta. Um, 
And uh, as I mentioned, we're also doing quite a bit of work on the Magellanic system. And once we get deep enough into that, I hope we get back to doing some more of the IVC and HVC work from this house. Thank you. We have time for a question. Oh, look, it's a question. It is very interesting to see the HR for towards the Magellanic Bridge. Uh, as far as I know, uh, there are not uh, high mass star forming regions, only uh, several young star forming regions. Uh, how do you interpret the origin of the H alpha? And are they correlated with the young stars? Um, so there is some star formation sort of out through here, and there's definitely some young stars in the bridge, like you mentioned. Um, in the paper, in um, Kat's paper, if you go read the Barger et al. paper, her initial model has actual leaking ionization from the LMC and the SMC. And that was a free parameter. And what she found is that if you just leaked about 2 to 4% of the Lyman continuum from those galaxies, it actually matched the intensity profile as you go from one galaxy to the other. So that's our current working hypothesis there. All right. Thanks, Matt.